people also want to tell us how they are celebrating Constitution Week or Constitution Day in their schools, in their homes, in their communities, let us know that because we'd love to hear about uh, Constitution Day celebrations. We've got a second grade class from Salt Lake City. Hello, Salt Lake City. Welcome. Just taking one care of one more technical thing and then we're going to get started. So thank you for coming today. Constitution Day scavenger hunt. That sounds like a lot of fun. Brooklyn, New York, celebrating at work. So am I. <laughs> but I'm lucky that my work is the Constitution. Hey, you're the host and we're live streaming. Thanks, Scott. Yep. All right, I'm going to make you a, a participant, okay? Sounds good. All right, everybody, we're gonna get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and record this session and then uh, we'll, we'll get started. Hello everybody and happy Constitution Week. My name is Jenna with the National Constitution Center and we are coming to you live from our museum on Independence Mall in Philadelphia. And we're so excited to be celebrating Constitution Week with you and gearing up for our big celebration this Friday, September 17th, which is Constitution Day. On Constitution Day, September 17th, 1787, the delegates who had been working all summer to create our Constitution gathered for one last time at Independence Mall then called the Pennsylvania State House in Philadelphia to sign the Constitution. Um, and then we remember that every year on Constitution Day on September 17th. So we're so happy that you have come to join us for this uh, special um, week of events. We have uh, our tour of signers hall today, which we're going to start in just a minute, but we also have a whole lot of great events planned, both on site here at the Constitution Center and online that you can join from anywhere for this coming Friday, plus tons of great resources for learning the Constitution every day. So please make sure to check all of those out at constitutioncenter.org. Also, if you like this virtual tour that you see today, we do uh, schedule those for school groups and um, you know community centers. So you can contact us about scheduling a, um, a virtual tour for your group. We would happy, we would be really happy to uh, to Zoom with you and uh, and uh, see you at your uh, school or community center. We are welcoming everyone in the chat. So if you want to, uh, if you have questions or if you just want to say hi, tell us how you're celebrating Constitution Day. Go ahead and put all of that in the chat. But without further ado, let's get to our you know, <laughs> tour of Signers Hall. And so it is my uh, privilege to introduce my great colleague, Madison, who is upstairs in Signers Hall right now, who's gonna show you a little bit more for, of this really special um, exhibit inside our museum, Madison. Thanks, Jenna, and hello, everyone, and happy almost Constitution Day. You are doing the right thing today by learning all about the Constitution, visiting our museum virtually for this amazing tour of Signers Hall. You all will have the opportunity to meet the 42 life-size bronze statues of the men present for the signing of the Constitution. Hands down, this is everyone's favorite exhibit, so we're really excited for you all to be here and to see this awesomeness before you. But I did want to make clear that while I do love sharing all about the founders, all about the framers, all about the Constitution. I don't like hearing my own voice that much, and I would love to hear your guys' questions. So if you do have questions or comments, anything about the Constitution, throw those in the chat, and Jenna and I will do our best to answer as many as we can. So please, if you have a question, if you see something really cool, throw it in the chat, and we will do our very best to make sure that we go over it. But without further ado, I feel as though it's time to really begin our time traveling all the way back to, let's say, the 1700s. Now I'm going to step out of the shot here so you can see this scene behind me. This is historic Philadelphia, right way back in the 1700s. This is what the shoreline of the city would have looked like way back when, some 250 years ago, right? Well, where does our story begin? It begins right here in Philadelphia, really in this little building right here that you see next to me. 
That is called the Pennsylvania State House, but you may know it as Independence Hall. Now, this is the site of the signing of two incredibly important documents throughout our nation's history. First, the Declaration of Independence, where we declare ourselves independent from the king. We are no longer going to be governed by the monarchy, and we are going to be 13 independent states here in the new world, in, in the colonies here in America. While we love the Declaration of Independence here, we totally know that it is an incredibly important founding document in our nation's history. We have to acknowledge what it actually does. Now, for those of you who know the Declaration, you might know that it lists essentially all of the reasons that the colonists are not going to be governed by the king anymore, that we are upset by this series of taxes that they have imposed on us. We hate this idea that, well, we've been living with no taxation without representation. We are not governed very fairly in this new world. We are kind of removed from our governing head that is way across the ocean, and we've had enough of this. We don't want to be taxed anymore, and we want to be represented fairly in our government. So we draft this Declaration of Independence in 1776, declaring ourselves free and independent states. However, nowhere in the Declaration of Independence does it say how we are going to govern ourselves. We know that we don't like a monarchy, we don't like a tyrannical government, but we haven't quite figured out yet how we're going to govern ourselves. And let me tell you, our first attempt was a disaster. It was called the Articles of Confederation, and it was essentially a loose league of friendship between 13 independent states. We all had our own governments in our own states. Nine of the states have their own navies. A lot of the states have their own currency. So I'm in Pennsylvania, and I know I have some friends from New Jersey tuning in. Maybe my $20 of Pennsylvania money doesn't equal $20 of New Jersey money. It's just absolute chaos. There's no real centralized authority and things are not going very smoothly. Spanish ships and British troops are perching on the borders waiting for America to fail. So it is, the stakes are high everyone, very, very high. So what are we gonna do about this? How are we going to ensure that we complete this revolution? Well, we are going to gather again 55 delegates right here in Independence Hall in the summer of 1787 to draft a new constitution. And that is exactly what we do. Now, without further ado, we are going to make our way in to Signers Hall where you will all meet the 42 life-size bronze statues of the men present for the signing of the constitution. Brace yourselves, it's awesome. All right, everyone, welcome to Signers Hall. I'm gonna step out of the shot here so you can see all of these statues. Like I said, 42 statues representing the men present for the signing of the Constitution, all created historically to scale. They used physician's notes and tailor's notes to make sure that we got their accurate heights, their accurate sizes, all of that. So this is pretty much what the room would have looked like on September 17th, 1787. We have a couple of famous faces scattered about the room that we're going to meet in just a second, but this is the view that you would have seen had you been present for the signing of the Constitution in 1787. Now, we should probably meet some of these famous founders, and I do not believe we can start with anyone other than Let's see, nickname the father of his country, a leader during the American Revolution, a powerful presence in the room is one Mr. George Washington. Now, George Washington here is an important player here at the Constitutional Convention. You all probably know him as, you know, the father of his country, the hero of the American Revolution. But what if I told you that after the revolution, George Washington was done. He was like, I want to go back to Mount Vernon. I want to relax. I want to spend the rest of my days not dealing with this stuff anymore. He wanted to return home and he was ready. He had kind of put in his time, put in his service and in securing independence and a revolution for the United States. So he's kind of ready to go, right? He's ready to retire. He's ready to be done with all of this work. This founding a new nation is a lot of work. Well, 
George Washington is essentially pulled out of retirement by several of his friends who write to him and they say, listen, we've got to do something to fix the Articles of Confederation. We have to do something to bring the nation together to find a centralized authority. He's very upset by Shays' rebellion that happens just a short time before the convention is called where there are riots in, in Massachusetts and it's just chaos. It's, it's looking as though this new nation is very, very fragile. So George Washington is brought out of retirement to come to the Constitutional Convention to lend his support to the cause. He is here to show that his presence is going to show to all of these men who are in this room that this is a task worth undertaking, that this is something that we must do as a nation to ensure that we do not collapse again. So something to, to consider during this time is that George Washington does not actually talk that much throughout the convention. He is not one of the, the primary you know, speakers. I mean, he will of course contribute, but he is not the, the primary contributor here. I will tell you that there is one, one other Virginian, if we have any Virginia folks in the house, uh, he will be a future president of the United States. He stands at just five foot four inches tall and he is one Mr. Quiet and Reserved James Madison. Everyone, I'd like to introduce you to the brains behind the operation. This is the father of the Constitution who is here alongside George Washington. You guys can get a nice little uh, view here and see this height difference here. But James Madison is here and so unbelievably, by the way, enthusiastic about this prospect of creating a new and lasting Constitution. He has spent the winter and the spring leading up to this studying the greats. He turns to the Greeks and the Romans to figure out how they were able to create such lasting democracies. He studies the great philosophers like Locke and Montesquieu to see how we can incorporate these ideals of the Enlightenment into the revolution, into the principles of the American Constitution. And he is a diligent note taker, by the way. If any of you take notes in class, you pride yourselves on being brilliant note takers, you would have been very proud of James Madison here because he keeps incredible records of everything that was said, everything that was done during the convention. And he is here as a, as a, uh, he doesn't have as a commanding as a presence, let's say, as a George Washington, but he is the brains behind this. He is the one who is in there taking notes, making sure that he's recording all of the civil dialogue that is happening during the convention. And he presents some incredible ideas. He puts them forth to the convention. And we're going to talk about a couple of those in just a moment. And Madison, I want to point out that, you know, the, um, the fact that he took all those really great notes is really helpful to us because we have now we have primary sources. So I know any teachers that um, are on uh, the Zoom right now know how important primary sources are and teaching primary sources are. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a primary source is a source from the time. So a textbook that might have been written by a historian in 2021 is a secondary source. They, they know about history, but a primary source is a letter or a journal or a newspaper article that's from the time. So they're, they're both really important important when studying history. And so I know that a lot of teachers really like to, to look at those primary sources and James Madison's notes from the convention are one. All right, let's take a couple questions from the audience. Um, one question was, um, they want to know about the statues. How were they made? So the statues, uh, Madison, if you want to pan, I can kind of talk about the statues. They were, um, made by Studio Ice in Brooklyn, New York. They are made of bronze. As Madison said, they are all life-size, accurate in terms of facial features, um, even down to like the clothing that they would have been wearing, um, their heights, you know, waist size, everything is all accurate. Um, what they did was they actually used real models to kind of stand in these positions. So that's why they have the, um, kind of very lifelike positions because they were modeled after um, human models uh, and then they were sculpted, um, you know, and then uh, bronze dipped. Um, so they were like, they used the, they used the sculptures created by the artist to create the cast for the bronze. And then they um, create the bronze statues from there. And so they are um, quite heavy, but they are uh, pretty, pretty secure in the, um, in the ground. Like for example, I know that Alexander Hamilton, who you can see right behind Madison is um, kind of in a, a very jaunty position, but he's not going to fall over. Don't worry. <laughs> um, 
Another question that we had was, um, was it called Independence Hall by the time of the Constitutional Convention? And the answer is no. The delegates would have referred to that building as the Pennsylvania State House. And actually, even past the Constitutional Convention, it, be, it was still a government building here in Philadelphia for a long, long time. Um, but that now we look at it as a historic site. It's under the, um, the care of the National Park Service, who are our great partner here um, on Independence Mall in, uh, in Philadelphia. And so they are. Um, uh, they they um, operate Independence Hall as a historic site. But at the time, in 1787, they would have um, these deputies in the room would have referred to the building that they were in as the Pennsylvania State House. And so we're getting a, a really good look at the statues. Uh, as you can see, we've got some uh, all the delegates from the different. Um, 12 of the 13 states. Anybody can tell me what state didn't send anyone to the uh, Constitutional Convention? This was actually a question on Jeopardy the other day. Madison, do you know that one? I do. Um, we had 12 of the 13 states attend, but a very teeny tiny state decided not to attend the convention. If you guessed Rhode Island, you would be correct. They did not send anyone to this convention because they were very fearful, right? This was not necessarily a beloved concept by everyone in, in these 13 independent states. Rhode Island is a small state and they worried that any kind of convention, any kind of revision to a centralized authority would take away what authority they already had. They didn't want to lose that. So they, they did not attend. And you know who else didn't attend? Patrick Henry. He said, I smelt a rat, meaning that he didn't think this was a good idea. He thought it was going to be a little bit of a corrupt convention, if you will. But luckily, we do have the rest of the states are here who have attended, um, including one we just touched on it briefly, but one very famous New Yorker who signed the Constitution, one Mr. Alexander Hamilton, one of three representatives from New York to sign. And before we get to Hamilton, sorry, Mazet, I just realized I misunderstood Fran's question. I'm sorry. The question was when <laughs> were the statues made? Um, so the Constitution Center opened in 2003. We broke ground um, in 2000. And so like over the course of those years are the, all of the exhibits and um, exhibit features were developed. So I, don't, I can't give you an exact date in there that they would have completed the uh, statues, but from 2000 to 2003 when we opened, that's when these um, statues were made. So they're not antique statues, they were made for the Constitution Center, but it's, uh, that's when they were created. Um, we do have another question about the Bill of Rights, but I think we're going to get to that a little bit later. So we do see your question about the Bill of Rights, but we're going to get to that soon. All right. Thanks, Jenna. We can make our way over to, we cannot come in to Signers Hall. Really, you can't come to Philadelphia without seeing this very famous face everywhere you look. One Mr. Dr. Benjamin Franklin, citizen scientist here. Dr. Franklin is the oldest attendee to the convention at 81 years old. He is here representing the Pennsylvania delegation. Now, I think we said we had a couple folks from Massachusetts, and though he was from Boston, he did relocate to Philadelphia. He spent most of his life here, right, in this beloved city that he loves so much. And Dr. Franklin, keep in mind, because of his age, he has seen the revolution in full force, right? He has witnessed some of these incredible events that have happened. He's lived through these events and he absolutely wants to be part of the conversation and how we're going to create a new constitution a lasting governing document that will exist forevermore that's his intent when he comes here he will offer his support uh, he will offer up some some anecdotes throughout the convention he has a way of going off and spiraling down some tangents but he will eventually come through come full circle to address the important concepts that need to be included in the constitution we have our core four if you will washington madison hamilton and dr franklin who are probably the most famous in this room but there are definitely some other players who i want to introduce you all to who don't get enough love regarding their contributions to the convention. Now that we've met some of these famous faces, I think it's important though we talk about what exactly they talked about during the Constitutional Convention. What was the purpose? Why are they here to begin with, right? Well, in order to do that, we got to go back to our friend James Madison. Because James Madison comes in with his game plan and he's like, listen, Articles of Confederation are not working. How are we going to address this problem? How are we going to fix this government? You know, we cannot have a, a king or an emperor or a czar or a monarch. We don't want that. He said, it's not, it's not 
not going to last, you know, but how are we going to make sure that in this new government we have, you know, an organized government, but one that's not too powerful, one that is not, say, a, a person at the head of the government. Maybe we divide the power between three branches and we have a, a equal uh, but checks of balance system that will happen during this constitutional convention. This is where we create the Congress, we will create the executive, and of course the judiciary. The idea being that each of these branches, each of these three branches, all have their own role, but none, put this away, none has total control. Right, so they can check each other's. They each have uh, individual powers and not one is more powerful than the other. This idea of a separation of powers is what we see kind of put forth uh, to begin this idea and these, you know, these thoughts around a new constitution and a new government. So we have our, our, three, our three branches of government. We have our separation of powers, but what does that actually look like? Well, we should probably start with our first branch, right? Congress, the legislative branch. And to talk about Congress, we have to go over, and my New Jersey friends will appreciate this, to a very concerned New Jersey man right over here, Mr. William Patterson. Now, William Patterson is here at the convention, and he is a little bit concerned. You see, New Jersey is a small state, right, compared to larger states like New York or Pennsylvania or Virginia. William Patterson is very concerned about New Jersey's representation in this new constitution. He believes that all states, each state is important and the residents are important. And he believes that every single state, regardless of size, whether or not you're a teeny state or a big state, every single state should have equal representation in this legislative branch in Congress. So he devises this, this New Jersey plan, right? This idea that every single state is important and we are going to give every single state an equal vote in Congress. <sighs> Let me tell you, there is a bit of opposition to this plan, uh, most notably by uh, James Madison and even James Wilson, who we're going to go meet now, uh, of Pennsylvania. And James Wilson is saying, listen, I hear you. Uh, all states are important. Absolutely. We cannot deny that. Each state is unique. Uh, absolutely. But Wilson's saying, don't you think that larger states that have bigger populations, like Pennsylvania, like Virginia, like New York, don't you think that those states should have more representation in this, in this new legislative branch because we have more people living there? Now, I'm curious if anyone, do you find yourself aligning more with Wilson over here with the idea of proportional representation, or do you find yourself aligning yourself more with the New Jersey plan and equal representation? Yep, everybody put that in the chat, whether you think, um, you know, equal representation slash New Jersey or proportional representation slash James Wilson, Pennsylvania, Virginia. What do you, uh, both Senate and House. Well, it looks like we have some students of uh, constitutional uh, law because they know that we uh, compromised. You guys are too good for us. I love it. Everyone, oh, we're seeing a couple of equal, equal, yep. equal, and both a compromise. Brilliant. Well, I mean, if you're all saying that, then you might want to be introduced to the man who came up with part of this plan, uh, who created this bicameral two-house legislature, one Mr. Roger Sherman of Connecticut, along with Oliver Ellsworth. See, Sherman here is saying, listen, I hear that there's points to both sides. I hear New Jersey. I understand you, William Patterson, but I also understand the concerns of the larger states. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to take a little bit of both of your plans, marry them together, and we are going to create a Congress comprised of two houses. As I believe it was Don or Jacqueline said, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The Senate falls more in line with William Patterson's plan back here. He, the Senate, regardless of how, how big you are as a state, regardless of what state you're in, pop it in the chat, students, how many senators per state? It's all equal, it's all the same number. You can pop that in the chat and tell us how many senators does each state have. Yes, everyone popping it in, excellent. We have two senators per state. Doesn't matter if you're a smaller state like Rhode Island or New Jersey or a really large state like California. Everybody gets two senators in the Senate. That's equal representation. 
However, to accommodate the larger states, Sherman and Ellsworth decide that yes, we should increase, we should create a House of Representatives that is determined by proportional population. So we have a lot of people living in Pennsylvania at this time, even just in Philadelphia, a lot of people are living here, which means that Pennsylvania is probably going to have more representatives than say a smaller state like New Jersey or Rhode Island. And that's how we get the House of Representatives. And that is all determined how many representatives you have in the House based on population collected by, by census data and more. So now that we have created our Congress, I believe we need to move on to the second article of the Constitution, Article 2, which brings us to the executive branch, the presidency. Now, you're probably wondering, Madison, why are you hanging out with Alexander Hamilton? He was never a president. You are correct. But Alexander Hamilton here had a little bit of a crazy idea for what the executive branch and the president should look like. Alexander Hamilton gives a speech during the convention saying that pending good behavior, president should be able to serve for life. And let me tell you that this does not go over well, because we keep in mind, we just fought a revolution to throw off a tyrannical government, to throw off a monarch. Why, when we're creating our own new government, would we want to have anything in there resembling a, a king or a czar or anything like that? So it's not his best idea during the convention, and the delegates kind of call him on it and and you know they they agree that it's not a good idea to have a president who would be able to serve for life but we do move forward in the in the convention and decide that yes we will have a president and the president will serve four year terms now here's a question i want you all to throw it in the chat how many years or how many terms pardon me how many terms can a president serve does anyone know you can pop it in the chat we have four years per term and serving two terms. Yes, we have two terms. And Don correctly pointed out uh, FDR, a president that will come much later down the road. But believe it or not, most people don't know that way back at the signing of the Constitution that we did not have term limits for presidents. And we all know our first president, father of the country, George Washington. George Washington kind of set the stage. He served his two terms, but then he was like, all right, I'm out. I don't want to do this forever. You know, I, I'll serve my time. I'll serve my, my two terms. I think that's enough. And then I'll step down. And that was the status quo for a really long time until we reach, as Don said, FDR. And that will then prompt a constitutional amendment, which will require just two terms. But early on at the beginning of the convention, we did not have term limits for presidents. We also figured out during the convention how to elect the president. Now, we do have um, something created called the, the Electoral College, and we can definitely pop some resources for that in the chat. I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole with the Electoral College, but we figure out that we're going to have designated uh, electors, if you will, who will be responsible for electing the president. So let's see, we've checked off Congress, we've checked off the presidency, we still need to discuss the judiciary. Now, the Supreme Court, if you will, the highest court in the land, I will tell you that Article 3 of the Constitution during this convention, they didn't pay as much attention to creating a federal judiciary as, say, they paid attention to representation in Congress or how to elect the president. It was, it wasn't as, it wasn't addressed as much in the Constitution, you know, what this judiciary would look like. You know, I'd be really impressed if you all can pop it in the chat, any of our students. How many Supreme Court justices do we have on the court today? You can pop that number and let us know. Excellent. I'm seeing some wonderful answers coming in. We have nine justices on the Supreme Court. Would you be surprised, though, if I told you that there have been times throughout our nation's history where we've had an even number of justices? I think as many as, as 10, as little as six, probably not a good idea, right, to have an even number of justices. The way that I like to think of the Supreme Court is the referees of our government, right? Some of you probably play sports. You can pop that in the chat if you play a sport, let us know. But the rules of your sport are, you know, in a rule book, and the umpire studies the rules of baseball. You have referees studying the rules of soccer and football. You have all of these officials who are skilled and knowledge in the rules of their sport. That is exactly what the Supreme Court is. They are experts. They are the referees of the Constitution. And their rule book 
is the Constitution. So if in, if a law is passed that they deem to be unconstitutional, doesn't fall in line with the Constitution, they can strike it down. They can call a foul. They can call a penalty, essentially. That is the role of the Supreme Court. And we'll see, especially, that throughout history, the Supreme Court definitely plays a huge central role in some of the biggest constitutional debates that we've seen in over in almost 234 years of constitutional history. So now that we've hit our three branches of government, we've got Congress, the presidency, and the judiciary, I think it's time that we talk about some uh, something, a topic here that the delegates were not necessarily willing to discuss. Um, as July ebbs into August, we are nearing the end of the convention, and the topic of slavery comes central right down to the convention and the delegates are absolutely going to discuss it. Some of the delegates don't want to. They don't even want to address slavery. They don't think it even belongs in the Constitution. They don't want to talk about this horrible evil that had been part of, you know, of American society for so, so long. And they don't want to address it. They say, mm, I'd, we'd rather not. Let's move it. We'll pass it off to the next generation to handle. But then you have some other delegates who are saying, no, that this is the opportunity to, to end slavery, to, to write it out of, of life, out of our culture. Let's get rid of slavery. Because, I'm going to pan around the room again, of the delegates in this room, over 20 of them, over 20, everyone, will enslave people throughout their lifetime. In fact, in 1787, one, one out of every five people living in America is enslaved. Slavery is a major part of everyday life for many Americans, and the delegates are forced to confront this issue. They need to address it, and this is where several debates take place. You see, we have to loop in some of these, some of the delegates here who have an interest in preserving slavery. You might be surprised to know that in some of the, in, that all 13 states, every single one of them, practice slavery. But some of the states with larger enslaved populations, perhaps in the South, they have an interest in making sure that slavery can continue, that they are able to enslave people. See, they would like to see the enslaved populations in their states serve them for the purposes of representation in the new Congress that we created. You remember how we just talked about that the population in each state will determine how many representatives you get in Congress. So you bet we have some of the pink knees here. You absolutely bet that some of these delegates are saying, we want to make sure that the enslaved people are counted for the purposes of representation so that we can have more power and have more say in Congress. Do we see the hypocrisy here? How are you going to enslave someone but still hope that they will help you attain more power in this new government? It is not an irony or hypocrisy lost on one Governor Morris here, who famously, you know, decries and he says to the to the slaveholding states, he says, no, if you would like to count them for the purposes of representation, set them free and let them vote. You know, you can't have it both ways. This is a hypocrisy that needs to be addressed. And we have an opportunity during this convention to write slavery out of the Constitution, out of American culture. We can get rid of it. Well, I am very sorry to share with you all that that did not happen. In fact, the delegates could not make any headway. There was continuous headbutting throughout this entire discussion that they decided for the purposes of moving forward in the convention that they were going to count enslaved people as just three-fifths of a person for the purposes of representation. This is called the three-fifths compromise. Now, the delegates have to move forward because they are still struggling to create an actual working government. But slavery, we will find, it will take you know a century later and another civil war to rid the nation of slavery and another century after that to address the institutions of segregation. So we see here the choices made by these delegates lay the groundwork for slavery to be incorporated into the Constitution. Madison, I want to make sure we get to Uriel's question because it's um, their birthday. So happy birthday. <laughs> um, 
So the question is about our Bill of Rights, and I think this is where we're probably going to go next with our dissenters, but why wasn't there a Bill of Rights incorporated? Why couldn't they have taken the time um, to, to kind of button that up and finish that last kind of piece of the um, of the convention be or of the Constitution before they concluded the convention in 1787? So I think that, like, yeah, heading over to our, our favorite dissenters is probably a, a great place to talk about that. Absolutely. And this is, I will, I've, we've made our way, keep in mind, from May 25th all the way until September of 1787. It has been a long, hot summer. Um, these delegates have not, they've all, they've been debating the new constitution. They've put a lot of work in, a lot of research in. And as we end out and we round out summer, folks are getting antsy. You know, I mean, people, some of these people have been away from, from their homes and their property for a long time. And, you know, it's Philadelphia. It, there was a black fly epidemic that summer. It was noisy. It was smelly. There was no air conditioning. Look at the clothes that they're wearing. I mean, everyone is kind of ready to, to be done. They, they want to, you know, put a stamp of approval on the Constitution and move forward. Which, Uriel, it brings me to your question because... Think about everything that we just discussed. During this long, hot summer, we have done, we've done a lot during this convention, right? We figured out how to elect the president. We established Congress. We created the federal judiciary. We've had a lot of successes, absolutely. But we have these three men at the end of the, at the end of the, at the end of the convention, we call them our dissenters here, George Mason, Edmund Randolph, and Elbridge Gary here, who are saying, listen, it's the day of the signing and you want everyone in this room to sign the constitution. We're a little nervous though, because you have just created an incredibly powerful government. Congress has a lot of power. The president has a lot of power and the judiciary, all very powerful branches of government. We are concerned, primarily George Mason here, that there is not enough in this new grand constitution that does enough to protect us, to protect the citizens, to protect you and me, ordinary Americans. There's not enough in here. He really advocated for a list of personal liberties or I'm sure we all know what's coming. He advocated for a bill of rights, certain unalienable rights that we have that should be included in the Constitution. Now, I will say that although the Bill of Rights was not included that day, uh, it is what prompted George Mason not to sign the Constitution. He went a little dramatic here and he said, um, this is James Madison's account. He said, Colonel Mason seconded the motion declaring that he would sooner chop off his right hand than put it to the Constitution as it now stands. Meaning he was very fearful of this new powerful government and he was holding out for a Bill of Rights. So one of the reasons that we don't see it included is that there is a general consensus and a feeling that people who are dissenting, like these three men here who don't sign that day, they're going to hold out and they're going to continue to advocate for that Bill of Rights, which, spoiler alert, we later get. James Madison will draft up 19 proposals, scale it down to 12, and then Congress will send those out, those articles out to be to be ratified and added. So we don't have a Bill of Rights. Sorry, go ahead, Jenna. I, I also wanted to point out there was kind of an argument against, it wasn't just that they wanted to go home, there was an argument and a feeling um, that by listing rights, you might also um, have the opportunity in future to use that list to, um, you know, hold back other rights that might not have made the list. Like you can't think of every single right that every citizen is going to have ever and put it in the Constitution. Um, but you know, there were some delegates. I think Hamilton was one that was afraid that, like, okay, well, if we put this list on paper, then that might in the future say you know, a, a government entity might say, well, that's not on the list. So you don't have that right. Um, and so they, they really wanted to, to, that was, a, they were a little wary of that, but Madison is right. Most of the consensus among most people was that we should still write this down. And that was actually kind of became one of the bargaining chips during the ratification process. A lot of states, um, because of this Constitution did not go into effect on September 17th. We should, although it is Constitution Day, we, we do have to remember that that was just signing day. It did not go into effect until it was ratified um, by the states. And a lot of the states kind of had the same thought that, J, uh, that George Mason did that said, where's the Bill of Rights? And so they kind of um, had a conditional ratification where they said, we will ratify this, but we want a Bill of Rights added to the Constitution 
immediately. And that's pretty much what happened. Absolutely. And Jenna brings up a really good point, everyone, that just on that day of the signing, we do have three people who choose not to sign. And that's okay. That's an American ideal, right? That is dissent. That is something we celebrate. Um, It's definitely inherently American. And that is something that we have to recognize and appreciate. And, you know, it does help to produce this this Bill of Rights, um, which we'll be celebrating December 15th, Bill of Rights Day, mark your calendars. We can celebrate Bill of Rights Day then. Um, But I want to kind of ask you all a question too, because we talked about that this is not the end-all be-all of the Constitution. Just because everybody signed it that day, except for those three, it doesn't mean that it became the law of the land. You know, we needed nine of the 13 states to ratify, to approve, to agree to live by these new rules of the Constitution. Thank you, New Hampshire, number nine, that pushed us over the edge, that made the Constitution the lay of the land, the law of the land. So when we celebrate the Constitution, we talk about the Constitution, people tend to ask me this, Jenna, you might get this question a lot too. People will ask you, well, what is your favorite part about the Constitution or what's your favorite amendment? So if you have a favorite part about the Constitution, feel free to drop it in the chat. But I do want to show you all this amazing way to kind of wrap up the Constitution and wrap up this kickoff to Constitution Day with this quote behind me from George Washington. Now, read this quote. I'm going to read it out loud. Ready? I do not conceive that we are more inspired, have more wisdom, or possess more virtue than those who will come after us. The power under the Constitution will always be with the people. We know, everyone, that we the people drafted back in 1787 did not include all of the people, but it's through the process of amendment, interpretation, and court decision that we the people can be a reflection of all of the people not just your George Washingtons, James Madisons, or Alexander Hamiltons, but you and me, right? We're part of this vision of we the people. And I think one of the best things about the Constitution is that we have the power to change it. Some of the best moments in American history have come out of constitutional change, abolishing slavery, expanding voting rights, and so much more. So when you think about the Constitution and you think about we the people, think about your favorite people from history, those favorite historic figures that have challenged the idea of what it means to be included in this grand experiment of the Constitution. So with that, Jenna, I'm going to turn it over to you for any final closing remarks or questions that we may have. Yeah, we have a couple questions um, that we'll try to get through because I don't want to leave anybody hanging, but I know I know we do need to wrap up. Um, questions about what happened to the dissenters afterwards. They actually were still involved in government, pretty actively involved in government. Um, uh, Elbridge Gerry is most famed, I think, for, for drawing a very oddly shaped voting district. And um, to this day, we still use the term gerrymandering to describe that, um, you know, oddly shaped voting districts, um, which had had their purpose, but yeah, that was um, kind of what uh, a a term. So it's still very well known um, in in active in government and active in American history. I don't have bios on all three of them, but you can look them up on our website. We do have some bios on the, uh, on not only the dissenters, but also all, everybody in, in the room there. Um, I think that was the only question that we left. People were telling us their favorite parts of the constitution, the preamble. I've never actually seen somebody say the preamble before, but that makes so much sense because it is kind of the, the sum up, the mission statement. So I love having that part as your, uh, your favorite uh, part of the constitution. Um, all right. I think that that is all of our questions. I'm glad we got to those, but thank you for joining us. I just want to wrap up by saying that um, we are so happy that you joined us for this special inside look at Steiner's Hall. It's, um, you know, a really great room. If you are in Philadelphia, please feel free to visit us. But like I said, we, we also do these virtual tours. Um, online for schools, for community centers, for after school programs. So if you're interested, tell your teacher, tell your parents, um, and uh, we might be able to book a book a tour for you. We also have great online classes for every topic under the rising sun um, all year round. We're starting tomorrow. They actually kick off um, with the Constitutional Convention, but we're, we're exploring federalism, the separation of powers, voting rights, articles one, two, three, uh, landmark decisions, and so many more. I haven't even mentioned all of them. Um, so those are every Wednesday and Friday with special uh guest lectures on Fridays. Um, So please make sure to check those out. All of this information is available on our website, uh, constitutioncenter.org, on our interactive constitution 
There's also lots of great um, asynchronous resources that you can use to um, learn about the Constitution on your own. Um, so please, we really do encourage you to check all of those out. And But most importantly, uh, because it is Constitution Week, please come back on Friday, whether you're joining us at the Center or online for our great um, programs, all sponsored by PICO. So thank you, PICO, for the support. Um, uh, we really hope to see you then. Thanks, everybody. Hi, everyone. Happy Constitution right. Week. Are you coming to the introductory level? Great, so that's the one at noon. Fantastic. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks, Jeffrey. Oh, thank you, Fran. Thanks for the questions. Hope we answered them. <laughs> oh, thank you, Rose. Have a good day. <laughs> Right, looks like we got a